Great. So as uh, Dan said, it's our uh, great honor and pleasure to welcome Don Ingber to uh, speak today, to give you a, a little bit of background uh, on him before uh, we uh, bring him up here. Uh, he earned a bachelor's degree, master's degree, medical degree, and PhD at uh, Yale University. And for his PhD research, he uh, did his uh, work under the uh, tutelage of uh, Jim Jameson, uh, working on uh, the role of basement membrane and extracellular matrix in cancer, uh, which is a very commonplace topic now, but this was at a time when almost nobody was studying this. Uh, he then moved on to Harvard Medical School, Children's Hospital Boston, for his postdoctoral training with uh, Judah Folkman, uh, who's now known as the, uh, the champion of angiogenesis in cancer. Uh, and so he went there as the Anna Fuller postdoctoral fellow, uh, did such great work there that he was invited to join the faculty, which he did in 1986. Uh, has been there ever since, rose through the ranks, and as Dan mentioned, eventually was named the inaugural uh, Judah Folkman Professor of Vascular Biology. Uh, he then, uh, in 2009, became the founding director for the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering, and I suspect that's what you'll be hearing about uh, in today's presentation. So Don has promised me, uh, or he's asked me to promise him not to uh, take up the entire uh, time uh, recapitulating a CV, which people always joke about, but I think we really could spend an hour talking about everything that he's done. So I'll just name uh, a few of uh, the uh, honors of the many that he's won. Uh, those include induction into the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Inventors, uh, as well as a, a fellowship within the uh, AAAS and the AIMBE. He's also won a number of society awards, uh, including pertinently for this audience, uh, the Shu Chen Award and the Robert Pritzker Award uh, from the Biomedical Engineering Society. So I had the great good fortune of doing my own postdoctoral training uh, in Don's lab, and I, I don't think the CV, the academic accomplishments, really sort of does justice to how he approaches uh, science. There's a beautiful synergy between art and science uh, where science uh, uh, essentially suggests artistic forms of expressing a complex scientific idea, and then that expression gives rise to new insights, which leads to, uh, to, to new discoveries. And so uh, I hope that you'll hear some, about, some of this in the talk today, but uh, beyond uh, all of the papers and the awards and the accomplishments, uh, Don's story really touches on many, many things, including uh, elements of sculpture design, comedy writing, modern art, uh, and animation. So I think that'll really come through in some of the other uh, work that the, uh, the Beast Institute is doing. <coughs> So the last uh, order of business before we bring him up here and ask him to, uh, to tell us about this is that uh, we have a plaque uh, to commemorate uh, his visit here, a small token of our appreciation. So we'll take some, uh, some photos and uh, then turn the stage over to Doug. There you go. All right. The, 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 yes. the, no, that's the, the, you should get these guys in there too. Okay, great. Thank you so much. The check is in the but I, you're not going to give it to me until I'm done. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the intros and the invitation. It's as uh, people like Tiama know, whenever students ask me like what program I should apply to in bioengineering, I always immediately say Berkeley. And then that's totally true. And, uh, and I think it's really, it's wonderful to be a place where people seem truly happy and supportive and creative and open and really are at the leading edge. So thank you so much for the invitation. I, um, as you have heard, I've been at Harvard uh, 34 years, it hurts me to say it, uh, on the faculty. Uh, but for the last nine, I have been the founding director of the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. And the basic concept is that it's based on the idea that engineering transformed medicine over the past 50 years by taking engineering principles and trying to solve medical problems, and it's been unbelievably successful. Hip implants, pacemakers, drug delivery, you name it, even though the geneticists have totally ignored that. Um, but uh, what we feel is that, thinking to the future, that we've uncovered enough about how nature builds, controls, and manufactures from the nanoscale up. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. So there's people with good hearing and people with bad. Is that better? Okay, good. So I was saying that, you know, uh, we feel that looking to the future that we've now uncovered enough about how nature builds, controls, and manufactures from the nanoscale up that we're in a position where we could leverage biological design principles to develop new engineering innovations. This is what we call biologically inspired engineering as opposed to biomedical engineering. What I'm going to do in this talk is to just give you a brief overview of work I did over the past 40 years in terms of uncovering biological design principles. And I'll give you a few uh, stories about how we've now begun to translate this. Because another focus of the Wies Institute is that we really believe that breakthrough discoveries cannot change the world 
unless they leave the lab. And so we're almost more of a translation institute than a research institute. So I'm going to give you examples of the sort of the fundamental work I did and then the more recent examples at the institute of how we leverage this to, uh, to, to hopefully bring about advanced health care in, in a variety of different ways. So <clears throat> I started as a graduate student and I raised this in the 1970s and early 80s, this bizarre idea that uh, development is controlled by mechanical forces and they're as important as chemicals and genes. And um, this was based on, as an undergrad, I took developmental biology courses, I saw movies, and if you look at a movie of a developing embryo, this is zebrafish, this is the yolk sac. In the beginning, the, the cells divide and they parse out cytoplasm, they get smaller and, and increase in number, but then they start generating mechanical forces in their actomyosin cytoskeletons that they pull on each other and they start accumulating matrix on the matrix and they physically sculpt all of the organs of, of, of the embryo in a matter of hours. And so all of the biochemistry that, I was a molecular biophysics grad student, we knew that molecular shape, molecular mechanics affects biochemistry, but then when you get to cell biology, there was no mention of mechanics. But a hundred years ago, all of development was controlled, was defined mechanically. It was just the baby was thrown out with the bathwater when, when genetics and chemistry came in. So I basically knew that in some way mechanics must be important. The other thing is when you take cells out of the body and you put them on a dish, on a, they spread. But if you put them on a flexible substrate, they actually compress it into wrinkles because all cells are in a state of isometric tension or pre-stress, just like a bow and a bowstring. You can't see it when it's rigid, but they're feeling the forces. So we went further over years and we developed ways where we could control cell distortion independently of growth factors and of matrix binding. We did this, the idea was if you created adhesive islands with a high density of matrix that would promote optim optimal integrin receptor clustering, and you made them the size of cells, surrounded by non-adhesive regions, you could think of like Teflon, then if you have a circular island, you get the cell bind and pull itself out and flatten, and you get a pancake-shaped cell. You made a small island, you get a cupcake, and a tiny, you'd have a golf ball and a tee. Saturating growth factor, saturating matrix, so you now have an independent variable of distortion. And we did this by collaborating with George Whitesides uh, this is in the late, this is around 1990, a long time ago. He had been developing an inexpensive way to make microchips for the computer industry. So usually you work in a clean room and you, you use a photo mask and you pattern uh, circuits and every chip has to be done in a clean room. What he realized is he developed a technique where you could pattern with a photo mask with photolithography and let's say little circular, you want a circular array. You make little circular holes with photolithography you then pour a liquid polymer, a silicon rubber, that polymerizes and retains surface topography down to 60 to 90 nanometer resolution. And you could use that as a rubber stamp, and you could make many chips. We use this to pattern extracellular matrix, and we could cover the intervening regions with a polyethylene glycol self-assembling monolayers. But the key point was that we could show that we could literally control cell fates by controlling the degree they stretch, and even when bound to saturating growth factors. So for example, big cell would proliferate, a tiny cell would go into apoptosis, program cell death, and um, we could, the, the reviewers made us do a control where if we took the small island and broke it up into many little focal adhesion sized dots, the cell spread over like a, like a suspension bridge over adhesions and had the spreading of the round big cell, but the matrix contact of the small, and this cell proliferated. So we could show we could switch between growth and death just by how far a cell stretches, and then if we made islands in the intervening degree of spreading with capillary cells, they could form, differentiate and form capillary lumens, capillaries with lumens, even though right next to them where there's no patterning, they were proliferating in the same medium. If we made cells with square corners, you could show that the, the, the resistance of the substrate really controls the shape. Now you give the motility factors and cells move by polymerizing actin and lamellipodi and filipodi, but they preferentially occur at the corners where there was no bias in a round cell. We could later show this is due to, this is where mechanical stresses are concentrated, that drives focal adhesion formation, that physically constrains signaling. But this is all controlled through physical interactions between the cell and the matrix. Now, the next question was how do cells sense and respond to these forces of what we started to call mechanotransduction. And when I got in the field, basically people thought of cells like a water balloon filled with molasses, you know, a membrane and a viscous cytosol. And they said, somehow you press on a membrane and you get, you know, 
lipid signaling. I presented an alternative idea, which is cells are built more like tents. So if you want to stabilize a tent, you have a flexible membrane. You put 10 poles in, you put 10 pegs in the ground, and then you sort of winch it in to put it under tension or pre-stress, and you have a stable shape. And this sort of building system it comes, actually comes out of the Buckminster Fuller world of geodesic architecture. It's known as tensegrity or tensional integrity. And uh, we, you know, I literally built sculpture models, sticks and strings, and uh, showed that you could build models with nuclei and that they'd be physically connected. And we did various experiments. Uh, Sanjay helped confirming that this is actually true in living cells. But for this talk, I think what was important is that it predicted that the way cells would feel force and respond would be like a pup tent. It feels the force where the pegs hit the ground, not at every point across its membrane. And so it predicted that where cells connect their internal skeletal framework to the extracellular support scaffold, like extracellular matrix or even other cells, would be a preferred point for force transfer. And to get at this, and this was, you'll see, we had to do my whole career, we had to develop new techniques because you don't get at this with, you know, SDS gel electrophoresis, this type of question. So we wanted to apply controlled stresses to specific receptors. So we took magnetic beads that were in anywhere from, we've, we've done nanometer to five micro, micrometer dimensions. We coat them with specific receptor ligands. We let cells bind, and then we could control, we could apply controlled torque or, or shear stress or, or tension. And this is a living cell from the side. We're applying nanonewton level forces. This is the nucleus. You could see it's responding as one integrated structure. And in science in 93, we could show that if you apply forces to transmembrane receptors that are metabolic receptors, growth factor receptors, the cell is very floppy. But if you apply them to integrins, which are the matrix receptors, the 10 pegs that connect the cytoskeleton to the extracellular matrix. Cells got stiffer and stiffer in direct proportion. We actually showed that you could explain this with tensegrity models and predict this. We later did this computationally as well. But it basically led to the discovery that integrins are mechanoreceptors in that they sense the first molecules to sense force and to transmit it over the cell surface over a specific molecular pathway. We and others then used this technique to show that pulling on integrins could activate specific signaling pathways and even turn on gene transcription. And just one example, the fastest mechanotransduction event we detected was by pulling on integrins on endothelial cells with magnetic beads in five milliseconds, we induced calcium influx. This is actually at the focal adhesion site in a stress-dependent manner, and we could show this is through beta-1 integrin through an ion channel called TRIP-V4. So I'm going to stop here, but just remember that we found that through this mechanical sensing, TRIP-V4 was very, very important. So now comes the Wies Institute, and so I'm going to tell you a story that will weave back to that, and the first one is, is the idea of engineering human organs in vitro. So when we got the, the, we got a philanthropic gift of $125 million to kickstart it, and the idea was to take on high-risk, high-impact problems, not incremental NIH-type stuff. And the biggest problem I could see was that the current drug development model is broken. This is just from a published paper. This is drug bioavailability measured in animals versus what they measured in humans. And it's like, you know, a random, uh, random graph. And this happens again and again and again. So without, I, I don't think I have to tell you that animal, animals are, you know, mice and rats are not humans, maybe a few exceptions. But um, uh, certainly in the predictability area for drugs, that's the case. So we started out a platform that I headed called Organs on Chips. And the idea was to engineer microchips containing living human cells that reconstitute organ level functions, not cellular tissue, but organ level functions to accelerate drug development, replace animal testing, and advance personalized medicine. And so basically, we had already shown that we had control over features at the same nanometer to micrometer scale that living cells and tissue live at with, with microfab. George and I had started to, to build microfluidic systems where we can actually put cells in them, and they're interesting because with with, with the size of microfluidics, you, don't, you only get laminar flow. So if you have two different dyes, they don't mix. And I'll show you how we leverage that later. But, the, the, but I'm a vascular biologist. And to me, this is like an engineered microvascular network. So we kind of put this all together. And we created what we call the human breathing lung on a chip. We're not building a whole organ. 
We're trying to distill it down to its minimal principles that recapitulate in vivo organ level function. Thinking, think of these as living three-dimensional cross-section of functional units of organs. And we started with the alveolus or air sac. You know, the, this is a major functional unit where, you know, gas exchange, uh, absorption of drugs, et cetera. It's a basically a simple structure with a, a single layer of alveolar epithelium and capillary endothelium. But what's important for respiratory function is that the breathing motions are absolutely critical. So again, mechanics is absolutely critical. But what defines an organ as opposed to a tissue is that you have two or more tissues together forming an interface, usually between a vascular tissue and a parenchymal tissue, where new functions emerge. So the principles we wanted to distill down to were reconstruct tissue-tissue interface, have dynamic flow of air and fluids, and have cyclic breathing motions. So I'm going to show you an animation how this works. These are the size of a computer memory stick. They're optically clear, made out of silicon rubber. If you cut it in cross-section, there are three hollow channels, each less than a millimeter wide. The middle channel has a vertical and bottom uh, part because we separate it with a porous uh, silicon membrane coated with extracellular matrix. We then take human lung alveolar cells on the top, we plate human lung capillary cells on the bottom. We just recreated the alveolar capillary interface. The trick is we have cyclic suction through the side channels, and it's all a flexible rubber. So we actually get cyclic stretching and relaxation at the same rate and degree as when we breathe. We then could actually, we, we can apply air to create an air-liquid interface. And now we could flow medium with or without immune cells. Or more recently, we culture the endothelial cells on all four sides and we could culture whole human blood without anticoagulants through these devices. So if this were to work, you should be able to mimic organ level function. So imagine you have an infection. What happens in your body is there's a tissue-tissue signaling. Cytokines are produced by the epithelium. They activate the endothelium to express molecules like ICAM that recruit immune cells that were otherwise just flowing by to stick, roll, diapedes, migrate across, and engulf the bacterium. So now I'm going to show you this is the real device. These are fresh human white blood cells. I know they're fresh. We took them out of Dan Hahn, my postdoc. Uh, they're, they're, you can't see the endothelium. It's not labeled. And the epithelium is behind the screen. So it's a quiescent endothelium. They just flow by. Now you put bacteria on the other side. That signaling between tissues occurs. ICAMs express. They're pulled out of the circulation. But now you can do any imaging you could do in vitro or in vivo in these devices. So we're going to go to higher mag in a second. Here's one cell. About here, it's going to find a space between two endothelial cells, and it goes through. Then it migrates, finds the matrix, wiggles its rear end out of focus through the little pore. Now it's going to come out the other side. You'll see it by phase. And then I'm going to show you the white blood cells in red and the bacteria in GFP green. And you will see them engulfed. So you just watch the all-human inflammatory response at high resolution in real time in this, in this little rubber chip. We then moved and tried to model, hit two birds with one stone. So we, pharma was interested, pharmaceutical companies were interested in toxicology and human disease models, which is really where animals fall thin. So we, we, we used interleukin-2, which is a FDA-approved cancer drug, and its dose-limiting toxicity is pulmonary vascular leakage causing pulmonary edema, fluid on the lungs. When we flow this intravenously, like in patients, so through the vascular channel, we see fluid filling the airspace as a meniscus that completely fills the airspace in three to four days. That's the same exact time course with the same dose as seen in humans. If you quantify it, we use fluorescent inulin like kidney physiologists do. This, we would never see this without breathing motions. This was never seen in a trans wall. This is static, this is dynamic. We went back to an animal model where we did a ex vivo ventilation perfusion so we could control breathing and do the same experiment. And breathing is also important in vivo. Now, I mentioned that I'd worked for all these years on mechanobiology. And this is like breathing-dependent difference in response. And I knew that GlaxoSmithKline was working on an inhibitor of TRIP-V4. And I was told that the program was kind of closing down and hadn't gotten traction. So I thought, maybe they give us the drug, which they did. They didn't fund us. They just gave us the drug. We completely inhibited pulmonary edema in this human model. They then took it and they tested it in dog and rabbit models of cardiogenic pulmonary edema when it's due to heart failure and back pressure. They got the same result. And we had back-to-back -back papers in science translation medicine. And this drug is now in phase one clinical trial. So it's an example of translational impact. When we submitted the paper to, to this journal, the one reviewer said, this should never be published. It's too simple. There are no immune cells. The other reviewer said, 
this is great. This is like synthetic biology at the cell, tissue, and organ level. They just showed you don't need immune cells for pulmonary edema. And we, and we got it in. And these sort of the medical assumptions that no one could ever test, we're finding are wrong again and again because of these models. So I'll show you another example. So this one model provided proof of principle for a human disease model, drug toxicity, drug efficacy, therapeutic target discovery, new drug discovery. I'm very proud it won the International Design Award a few years ago. We beat out at Frank Geary Building and the Google Car. And, uh, <laughs> and even my wife is more impressed that uh, this was acquired for the Museum of Modern Arts permanent collection. And that means I'm a permanent member and I get discounts in the cafeteria. And that, <laughs> th that really got her uh, all the things I've ever done in my career. It's very funny. <laughs> So we then went on, we took this, and the drug companies were interested in asthma and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So that's a disease of the bronchial, not the small airway, not the alveolus. So we took the channel, the chip, we made the top channel a millimeter high, which is the radius of a small airway. We used primary, uh, bron a primary uh, bronchial al alveolar, uh, I'm sorry, bronchiolar epithelial cells. Normally, they're, they're, they basically are mucociliated. We grow them at an air-liquid interface, only feeding them through the capillary channel for three weeks. Again, our, our cells only live fed through the capillary side. And this is what they look like, cilia and mucus across the whole millimeter, highly differentiated. Those cilia are actually functional. They're moving in a directional way. And if you put fluorescent microparticles to measure mucociliary clearance in this real-time movie, they are moving exactly at the same rate that mucus is moving in all our lungs at this very moment. You could actually see the, the difference between a tissue chip and an organ chip. If you look at cytokine production, and we mimic viral infection with poly-IC here, the black bar is the organ chip. These two different grays are either the epithelium alone or the endothelium alone. They each respond by putting out cytokines, and probably you get you know, a statistically significant blip, but there's a synergistic response, and this is well known in vivo that there's epithelial endothelial crosstalk. We are now funded by NIH to look at influenza H1N1 infection on chip. is working absolutely beautifully. But I just want to give you an example of things to come. So this movie is uh, actually a GFP Sendai virus because we just made the influenza virus with GFP. But what I'm going to show you is the imaging. You can see what's going on in these cells when you add uh, like GFP virus. And th these are graphs of two cytokines. And we now have made miniaturized uh, 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 ELISA's where we could do 64 cytokines simultaneously. So just imagine 64 of these. So when I click, this is going to be adding virus, boom. So now you begin to see infection happening, and you see IL-6 goes up immediately, but Rantus is no change at all. And now this goes up and down, and this is coming up over time, but you could be watching what's going on in the cells. And we used to measure like once every day. Okay, but imagine 64 of these. So this is the kind of insights you could do with these you can't do with human studies or even animal studies. So then uh, Cambus Benham was the postdoc. He, he obtained cells that are from human patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, differentiated on CHIP for three weeks, and amazingly, they retained the disease phenotype, just the epithelium, uh, as measured by Tolar receptor down modulation. And now what brings COPD patients to the emergency room are exacerbations either by viral infection, bacterial infection, or cigarette smoke. So we use poly-IC to mimic viral infection and LPS endotoxin for bacterial. And you can see that the COPD patients, the, you give a statistically significant increase with LPS for IL-8. These cells specifically upregulate MCSF with viral infection. And so the healthy, no change. So you could actually see ex exacerbation of response. And this may even be a biomarker for the ER of whether a patient is there with needs antibiotic for bacterial or antiviral. Now, Canvas, you couldn't stop him, so he built a cigarette smoking robot. Uh, <laughs> this is a cigarette lighter from a car. This is a Gatling gun with 10 real cigarettes. You control the puff interval, frequency, intensity. You have cigarette smoke going right to the airspace, no cigarette extract the way experiments are done now. And it was really interesting. You can see that COPD chips are more sensitive to cigarette smoke. There's no change in LDH, IL-8, or um, hemoxygenase-1 uh, well, there's no change in IL-8, let's focus here, at all, in normal chips with cigarette smoke, and there's a doubling with, with these COPD chips. Now we did transcriptomics, and we do multiomics now on these chips. The three lanes at the right are three different patient chips. This, this is normal chips exposed to cigarette smoke. The nine here are from a published paper of normal people who have no known disease who smoke cigarettes. 
the reviewers gave us a big hassle because they said, okay, the top quarter versus the bottom three quarters are pretty similar, but you have so, such you know, close replicas and, and higher levels of expression and, and you don't mimic what you see in patients. And then we realized that we actually could do human clinical studies better than, than, than it can be done in patients because this is matched comparative modeling of the same patient before and after a stimulus so we could actually see cause and effect and we actually got the paper in and changed the title to match comparative modeling uh, in lung chips. So this is something I didn't expect, but we actually can have a much better feel of mechanistic cause and effect response coupling. Hyun Jun Kim uh, built a, what he called the human gut on a chip. We made it higher, wider. We gave it peristaltic-like motions, trickling flow. We started with human CACO2 intestinal epithelial cells that originally came from a tumor, tumor Farmer uses them for barrier function on trans walls. It takes three weeks to get a poor barrier. They usually grow as a flattened cell, even though in vivo their in intestinal cells are columnar and, and grow in villi. But if we, in five days, if we give them flow and peristalsis, they spontaneously form villi across the entire chip. If you label them for proliferative cells, like in, in the, vil the villus crypt, the proliferative cells are basal, and then they move up when you wash out. We get all four lineages of small intestine. We get better barrier function. We get P450 drug metabolizing enzyme activity, which is known in the intestine, never seen in 50 years of culture with these cells. And we get mucus production, never seen with these cells. And we don't change the medium of any of these experiments. The medium is the same. It's just the physical environment has changed. Now, because we have flow and mucus, we, we actually can do what may be one of the more important things we now have done, which is we can grow living microbiota, commensal microbes in contact with living cells for extended times. Like all the work on microbiome, which is paradigm shifting, are due to metagenomics and genomic analysis. You can't, it's contamination if you put them in culture. And in fact, we can confirm that if you take a commensal microbe, lactobacillus GG, in 24 hours you lose barrier function in a trans wall because it's contamination. But we culture them with flow and, and all of these physiological mimicry, and we actually get better barrier function over time, which is why people take probiotics. Now, when I went to med school, I was taught after surgery and anesthesia, you need to have, get the patient eating as soon as possible to get peristalsis moving so that you, they don't get ileus, which is, small, which is bacterial overgrowth that can lead to sepsis and death. And all the medical books say this is due to stopping flow. But, you know, it also could be mechanical deformation. So we can separate those two, and we found while keeping flow and stopping mechanical deformation, you get bacterial overgrowth. So it's another medical assumption that was wrong that we got insight to. Now, if you put pathogenic bacteria like enteroinvasive, they completely overgrow. We use this as a model for inflammatory bowel disease. I'm just going to and you can see the sides of the villi in white because it's a little hard to see, but if you just focus here, if you give the enteroinvasive bacteria, you completely lose the villi and you measure barrier function here by transepithelial electrical resistance, you lose barrier function. And this is what happens in vivo, it's called villus blunting. If you give endotoxin, we had no effect on either barrier or villi. And we know in vivo this has major effect. But this is the synthetic biology. If you don't mimic physiology, you're missing something. So now we added back immune cells. We added back peripheral blood mononuclear cells. We flow them through the bottom channel. They spontaneously migrate up. And now with LPS endotoxin, we get blunting and we lose barrier function. But we can collect, like I showed you, the, the, the fluid coming out of the two channels, and we can measure cytokines. And we measured 12 cytokines that have been implicated in IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. None of them came out of the lumen, but we got, only with the combination of LPS and the immune cells, we got four, IL-1 beta, IL-6, IL-8, and TNF-alpha. We can measure their concentrations in that effluent, and now we can go back and add them one, two, three, four at a time, and only with that combination of those four at that concentration do we replicate injury and blunting. So we can begin to get insight into multi-component interaction, which is really how biology works and how drugs affect. Now, this is unpublished. We've been working for years on developing a hypoxia gradient so we can culture aerobes and anaerobes. And I'll just show you one slide, which is we're just about to submit this, that we can now culture whole complex human microbiome, aerobes, anaerobes. This is 15 different uh, genera of bacteria 
uh, and we could basically mimic and sustain for extended times what we see in vivo. So I think this is going to be really, really exciting. Now, with all this, we have every paper we submitted, they give us pushback because these are CACO2 cells that came from a tumor. But we just published this week, two days ago, that we now take human biopsies, we make organoids, we then break the organoids up, put them on chip, and again, only with flow do you get villi, and this is what the villi look like from above and from the side. This is mucus, the proliferative cells are at the base. And we did the first head-on comparison I know of where we did transcriptomic analysis, and if you look at the right three lanes, this is an organoid from the duodenum, this is the intestine chip that we made from that same organoid, and this is the real human duodenum, and you can see we are much closer for defense response, digestion, various things, and across the whole genome, it's, we're, much, we're mimicking much closer what's happening in vivo. Now, we, for years we tried to make a, make a kidney glomerulus chip, but we couldn't do it because you can't get mature human podocytes, which interface with endothelium to make the glomerular filtration border. Uh, Samira Musa did a, a, a you know, yeoman's job at literally developing an entirely new IPS directed differentiation technology that gives you mature human podocytes with greater than 90% efficiency on chip. She does it, puts IPS in the top channel and induces them to become podocytes. Uh, I won't go through all the characterization because it's published. This, they put out beautiful processes. We now put human glomerular endothelium on the other side, and, what you, and, we, and we give them one beat per second of 10% strain, distortion, because I gave an opening talk at a, a kidney meeting, and they can show that with each heart pulse, this, the glomerulus stretches. So only when we do that, you see foot processes going through the pores in the membrane and connecting to the other side, and only with that, we could actually mimic the, the urinary clearance and the glomerular filtration rate in vitro. We published this last year, cancer chips. I, I've worked in cancer since the 70s, and, and the big advance in the mouse world is to use orthotopic models, where you put you know, breast cancer in a mammary fat pad or prostate cancer in the prostate region, and it behaves more like in vivo. We have human organ environments, so why not make human orthotopic models? So we took a a, a non-small cell lung cancer that's an adenocarcinoma that in, in vivo forms at the interface between bronchioli and alveoli, but they always grow in alveoli. And now we have these different chips, so we grow them in these chips and we find that they grow much more rapidly than the alveoli. Uh, there's a lot in here, but basically if you give them the medium we use for chips on a plastic dish, the tumor cells don't grow at all. That's the white dots. So every bit of growth comes from the microenvironment on the chip. This is the growth in the classic you know, tumor cultures with serum-containing medium. This is the medium we use on chip. If this is plating the cells on the, on the airway chip at the time the normal cells are plated. There's slow growth. Plate them the same way on the alveolus, there's rapid growth. But the airway chip is actually pretty thick. So if we microinject tumor cells after it's differentiated, they're just dormant tumors. They just sit there. They're alive, but they don't grow. What was really amazing is we did plus or minus breathing, and we found that breathing suppressed tumor growth by 50%. And if we look at invasion, which you could do beautifully in these devices through the pores, it inhibited invasion by 50%. So imagine one of us gets a tumor in our lung right now, and the cells start proliferating. Soon they're going to fill up an alveolus. When they do, it's going to stop moving because it gets so rigidified. If this is right, that's a positive feedback loop to make them grow even more rapidly and out of control, and then another alveolus. And so now you have this rapidly growing tumor. Now you take drugs like tyrosine kinase inhibitors. They shrink back the tumor. The doctor's happy. You leave. And then you end up having persister cells that are still there, and, and it comes back and, and you die. Uh, with this, you could actually begin to mimic these cells that are, 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 are still in these devices. If you put them in different organs, of dormant tumors, so you could maybe target drugs for dormant tumors. But the amazing thing is we found the breathing motions work all the way down at, at response to chemotherapy. So uh, this is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Without breathing, you could see significant inhibition. There's, with breathing, they just grow slowly, but they grow right through it. And actually, this regulated all the way down to e EGFR receptor signaling. No, we don't know how it works, but 
Again, you can never uncover this with other types, other types of tools. So basically what this is, is really this synthetic biology approach where you use one cell type. If you mimic physiology, you just found assumptions are wrong about more complexity. If not, you have to add more and more complexity to the system. We've now done about 15 different human organs chips on chips. But when I first presented a review years ago on this, I, I, I said, because we have chips that have a vascular channel, we could connect those vascular channels and create effectively an integrated human body on chips. So you can imagine putting an oral drug through the gut chip, watch it be metabolized by the liver chip, peed out by the kidney chip. Do you have heart tox? What does it do to bone or aerosol drug? And uh, we actually have done this. Uh, this is in review. We've actually done 10 organs for four weeks, but this is eight organs. We actually developed an automated instrument. We use robotic samplers to go from chip to chip because there's so much dead space and dead time in the tubing. Uh, plus, you could integrate with the pharmaceutical drug pipeline. But here we had uh, gut, liver, kidney, heart, lung, skin, blood, brain, barrier, and brain. And the idea, and this was funded by DARPA, was to be able to mimic pharmacokinetics of drugs so you could determine like what dose and what regimen to go to humans. And we've actually have preliminary data that's in review where we did this. We took uh, nicotine like, and put it through the gut, so it's like a nicotine gum, if you like. And we could measure the kinetics and the metabolism. And the, the, the timing is very slow, but we collaborated with a company called CFDRC, and we use computational modeling that can scale and can deal with package loss into PDMS. And um, out of that, you get a time course that predicts, uh, this is predictions that came out of it, of, this, of nicotine absorbed in three different formulations published in a paper in Sweden 10 years ago where we beautifully can predict the pharmacokinetics use, using these integrated chip systems. So I think the big game changer here is, is you know, now these big companies do a drug, they fail with you know, thousands of patients, and they do number crunching to find a genetic subpopulation that maybe responds better. And if they're lucky, they'll do a small trial and get approved. With these chips in IPS, you can now actually think about you know, taking 200 women with you know, Hispanic, with asthma, hypersensitive to cigarette smoke, develop a drug for them, and then test the drug on those patients. I think it's going to just change the way we do things. Also, you could think about individual patients, and uh, uh, I'll mention later, this is now being commercialized by a company called Emulate. Yesterday, Cedar sinai Medical Center said they're now using these with patients to do this type of thing where you could test drug on individual patients' chips these chips internally for evaluating cosmetics, dietary supplements, food, and hopefully that will move to drugs over the next couple of years as well. So if I have a couple of minutes left, I'm just going to give you some other examples where we actually have impact on clinical medicine. So again, another big challenge we looked at was sepsis, you know, major killer worldwide, basically increasing antibiotic resistance. And um, the, 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 this is something that, you know, is even in the best so the idea we had was going back to those microfluidic systems where I said there were two channels and the, and the, the red and green dyes wouldn't mix because of laminar flow. So I thought, well, what if we put blood in sterile saline? We could pull things across it that are bigger than a dialysis pore. And then we thought, what would be useful? And we thought, well, sepsis, you want to get rid of pathogens and the, 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 the pathogen debris called PAMPs that trigger the inflammatory cascade. So we actually did this, uh, Ju Kang in the group, where the idea is that blood flows out of the patient, goes to this device. We use magnetic beads, which are the beads that I used to pull on integrins with, that we worked out very specific coatings. And the idea is that you have something that binds the pathogen, you put magnets across, and you cleanse the blood. And this is a, a movie of how it works. So in this, you can have saline flowing on the top, human blood at the bottom, and the beads are fluorescent. So essentially, you know, they flow by, you put the magnet up top, and you'll see here the beads and whatever they bind is cleaned and the cleansed blood goes back to the patient. Uh, but, but the problem is 70% of patients who have fulminant sepsis are always blood culture negative. You never know what the pathogen is. So for a paper, you could do an antibody to E. coli, but you don't know what the pathogen is. So when we started the Wies Institute, we really did look to biology for inspiration. Um, I remember I, in med school, we were taught that there are things called opsonins, which are generic pathogen binding molecules in our blood. One of the first hires from industry, we have 40 people from industry, Mike Super, I, I knew he was an infectious disease person. 
I said, do you know of any obstinance? He said, I did my PhD on manos, manos binding lectin. It binds to manans, carbohydrates, on all sorts of pathogens. Uh, but it activates complement and coagulation, and we were going to put this in blood. But he came from the biotech world. So in three weeks, he engineered this by just expressing the carbohydrate binding domain, removing the d domains that would activate bad things like complement, putting an FCIGG so you could have simple purification and also stability. It's the way pharma makes drugs. And this, when you put it on magnetic beads, binds gram positive, gram negative, fungi. In fact, it binds over, now over 100 different pathogens and toxins, fungi, gram negative, gram positive, viruses, parasites, uh, you know, toxins, uh, tuberculosis. So we have this generic capture agent. We then built a little rat intensive care unit. We, um, the blood goes out, we mix the magnetic beads, it goes to this device, cleanse blood goes back. And this is just one example where we gave the animal lethal endotoxin, they all die within four and a half hours, and we kept 85% survival by being on this little, little uh, spleen-like device. Now came the next step in translation, we started talking to investors, FDA, and they realized that you got to worry about the magnetic beads getting back into the patient, they're very expensive, um, and we, we basically said, well, the key part is the capture protein after all of this, and so we just put it on us on hollow fibers that are FDA approved as, seps as dialysis units, and we got similar clearance and we could show synergy with antibiotics. When the antibiotic kills the bug, it releases the debris, this captures the debris even better. And so um, the other thing is we realized we could capture the bugs and the debris without knowing what it is. So we can now deal with this diagnostic problem that not being able, you know, 70% blood culture negative. We developed what's effectively something like an ELISA where we have this FCMBL on magnetic beads, we bind it in whole blood, we pull it down, and then we use horseradish peroxidase on MBL, and we could basically see, are there PAMPs in blood? And with 150 human patients, we could show we get 85% sensitivity and 89% specificity. So this is only 18% were blood culture positive. We had 85% of those patients, we could tell you, you have a blood culture infection. So now we have a, a companion diagnostic as well. Last quickie, while I was doing this, we were funded by DARPA, and they wanted us to, to have, do all this blood purification with anticoagulants, and so we needed to have some coating that could prevent uh, uh, the need for heparin. So Joanna Eisenberg has a platform at the VIS where she was developed what it called nonstick uh, slippery liquid-infused porous surfaces. She was inspired by the pitcher plant. When it's dry, insects crawl all over it. When it's wet, they just fall in like a black hole and they're eaten, like a Venus flytrap. And basically, it's like a nanostructured surface that holds a liquid. She then built um, you know, artificial nanostructured materials, put perfluorocarbons, and you see this poor humiliated ant that just slides down it. You can then use this, the, one of the stickiest things in the world is crude oil. And not only does it not stick, it's self-healing. So if you cut it, the liquid just flows back. And you can see that's with a razor blade and it just heals it. And this has been commercialized in a company called Slips for, for mostly non-medical applications. But we need to deal quickly and with existing medical devices that are notoriously smooth because if you expose a rough surface, it's procoagulant. So we modified this, Dan Leslie and my group, chemically conjugating a perfluorocarbon, tethering it, and then putting a liquid perfluorocarbon so that it's just held in a very thin liquid layer. Now if you take a medical grade material that whole human blood without heparin just clots immediately. If you now put a uh, co simple coating with the existing medical device, it just rolls off. We took a arterial venous shunt from the hospital, coated it, had it in a pig for eight hours without anticoagulant, anticoagulant and we didn't get clotting. And, and this, this is now being commercialized by a company called FreeFlow. And Opsonics has, has just gotten an IDE for patients with a sepsis therapeutic device. Emulate is up to 90 people. It's now selling instruments and chips to academic labs. They just published yesterday on the web this collaboration with Cedar sinai Personalized Medicine with Roche, with uh, Takeda, AstraZeneca, and pretty much every biotech and pharma company uh, you, can, you can think of. So this is an example, you know, the VIS Institute is nine years old last month. But you know, what I just described is mostly from my lab, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. Bob Poole is on our committee knows. We've had 2,000 patents. We have 
20 startups. Uh, we've had one science or nature paper every month since the day we were formed with 14 to 18 part-time core faculty. Uh, when we started, we thought this would be an institute that would invent bio-inspired materials and devices, but we realized is that it's really an institute for disruptive innovation. Uh, it's, it, you know, I, I could answer questions later, but we really, we bring in 40 people from industry and we integrate them with undergrad, grad students, fellows. Uh, it's a very different model, but it's really turned out to be something quite unique. Anybody who's interested, uh, first of all, I should thank, you know, you can't do this without incredibly interdisciplinary uh, groups. Uh, I mentioned Joanna Eisenberg around the uh, collaboration around the TLP technology. I didn't mention Kit. Kit has been developing many of those organs on chips and muscle and brain. Um, and uh, was in, instrumental in the, in the DARPA grant. Um, but this is what the Institute allows us to do, is to bring people from every discipline, people that are more commercial, entrepreneurs, uh, people who understand what, what, what prototyping is, what timelines, milestones, and what application-specific uh, focus is all about. I invite you to the website. We were very proud we won the Webby, which is the Academy Award of the Internet for the best science website a few years ago. We got bored, so we designed a new website, and we won two additional Webbies and a W3 <laughs> award. Uh, so please come. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Yes. Um, and I was wondering, if you focus on a specific example. Uh, you chose peristalsis, uh, whereas most of the motion in the gut, particularly in duodenum, is by segmentation. Any reason why you chose peristalsis? Well, it's, you know, when I say peristalsis, it's at the cell level, it is experiencing cyclic deformation. You know, the, the wave is moving by it. So all we're mimicking is what the cell experience. It's like, again, it's this living three-dimensional cross-section. In the lung, people ask me, have we made curved ones to mimic the, the round shape of the alveolus? But you know, from the cell perspective, if this is an alveolus, I'm here flat, this guy's flat, and that guy's, so I feel stretch. And so if, it, if we needed the round, it wouldn't have worked, but it does work. So you know, in terms of the more interesting question is like frequency dependence, you know, strain dependence, tension dependence. We, you know, we've done that in different times in different systems. There's, this, there's just so much going on and so much, there was, you know, the, the funding was really around validating it more for this drug development side. We didn't go into, we just started by mimicking what the literature and the in vivo studies had said would be representative. Um, I think the frequency dependence of mechanotransduction is like one of the biggest open areas because it's amazing that, you know, in, in your body, uh, the cells in your aorta feel about 10, 15% strain. And if you isolate them and you put them in vitro, they will be most sensitive to that level strain. But your bones, your osteocytes in bone, micro strain, but, but while the blood vessel is one beat per second, one hertz, it's high frequency micro strain in your bone. You take osteocytes out and you put them on a dish, they, they can respond to micro strain high frequency. So at, at the cell level, they, they can sense that. Now that's probably cytoskeleton, adhesions, but nobody's worked that out. Uh, it, it, so that's really where I think the interesting questions lie, mechanistically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I mean, I had a startup in 1998 that was 3D printing of medical devices, 1998, because I saw that, you know, solid freeform fabrication was using for prototyping. They were beginning to get down to a size scale that was interesting. I was right. I was just too far ahead. The company died in like, you know, three years. But that's a whole other, other story. But so, yeah, you got to keep your, you, know, you always think like, the more you cross barriers, the more you see methods, tools, materials that may be useful for you. That's why I never understand how why people want to just stay in their field and go, you know, keep iterative improvements because you could just make quantum leaps when you see 
people have found materials in other areas. And that's what bioinspired engineering is about. You know, whether you take a virus and you use it now to make materials or, 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 or so forth. In terms of, you know, if you, do, if you do translation, you have to be pragmatic because when you get to the FDA world and the investor world, everything has to get dumbed down and simple and cheap. So we spend all this time, you know, sophisticated computer microchip manufacturing, intersecting with bio, and now the company is using injection molding and extrusion to make these chips because they have to do it cheaply and quickly. And, you know, and so, uh, so that's, that's a lesson. On the other hand, we would have never gotten there if we didn't have the, 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 the freedom of exploring with, with microfab. I think the microfluidics has certain strengths in terms of multiplexing and miniaturization. Um, but then you have to be able to do this inexpensively in ways that can translate. I think, um, you know, as, uh, I think Kevin was showing me some stuff with light polymerization of materials. You know, that's something I, again, like 10, 15 years ago, when people are thinking about 3D printing, I mean, there's got to, in the long run, people are going to come up with things that do whole sheets at once because it's got to be quick and cheap using light diffraction patterns or something and, you know, being able to build layers. Jennifer Lewis at the VIS builds in, in solid cellular, like ball, the whole thing is cellular, but it's viscous and then she builds liquids in 3D, not layer by layer and just amazing things happening. But you have to match the technology with the question and the application. So uh, if you're trying to mimic uh, organ level physiology, you might say, let's build a 3D liver. And you might be able to do it, and three, an organ over it, but, but for a pharmaceutical company, they want to understand mechanistic insight. And if you do a 3D liver, why not perfuse a real liver? And both of them, you can't see what's going on. You can't individually control each parameter. Like, we can add one cell, two cell types, three cell types, four cell types, gradients, chemical factors, mechanical factors, and we can see how they all interplay to get at mechanistic insight. So you think pharmaceutical companies are doing high throughput screening, but they know how to do that. That's not what they're, they're looking for high content, high value. If they've spent 100 million which one do they go to the clinic with? Or they go to the clinic and they have toxicity. Which one do they, you know, get around that problem and go back to the FDA with? Uh, Janssen, we published a paper with them. They had a, a biologic, a monoclonal antibody that had no toxicity in animals. And in humans, clinical trials, something like five patients died of pulmonary thrombosis. And so we can mimic that on the chip with blood in the lung chip. They are using to go back to the clinic. Now, if they can find a drug with that, that may be one of the first times they'll go to the FDA and say, we don't have an animal model. You know, we want to use this. And if it works, then that thereafter would be able to be used for pulmonary thrombosis model. Um, and I think, you know, that's the way things would happen. Uh, we also have collaborated with multiple pharma where we're doing dog, rat, and human liver chips because every pharmaceutical company and biotech has to do preclinical testing and they always get conflicting results and then they have to wing it. And we have beautiful data now where we can mimic they, with their drugs where they know human, rat, and dog. That may really change things. But that, that's, those are the types of things that it's really the need of the, of the users and, and the industry that you gotta kinda have a feel for. And by us hiring people from the industry and integrating them with teams, we knew that from the beginning. I think that's one reason we, we, we've been so effective is designing experiments that are not trying to mimic what as a, you know, an academic I think is interesting or what somebody's already modeled to show we can get, but like what the end user wants. And I, I, I think being problem focused and application focused really makes you take the most, the shortest path to impact. Oh, yeah. If you uh, don't have a chance to ask it here, you should have a chance afterwards. So, um, maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe more specific question. Sure. Those are very uh, interesting results. Um, uh, mechanical stress is on two of those. Yes. Um, I think one of the, the really uh, big problems with treatment is the uh, addition of drug resistance in tumors. Could you see any impact on that front? So, what I showed you is that, that basically with the breathing mo motions, you basically have a dormant tumor. It, it just, it doesn't respond to the drug. 
And also, we've now been using these to discover new drugs and using machine learning and multi-omics and so forth. But like, we then take that drug and we'll test it against the lung tumor in the lung, in the brain, and in the liver, total different responses in each. So, you know, it's, it's the same cells, it's the same genome, it's the same signaling. Irina, do you want to ask a question? Because I can see she really wants to ask a question. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Yeah. So first off, I mean I I just talked at Biophysical Society where I talked about our organ engineering with mechanobiology, but just very briefly we found we could show that the earliest step in most epithelial organs are mesenchymal condensation beneath where the bud's going to form. And we could show that that is mechanically controlled. And then we could show that the compaction, the compression of the cells triggers gene transcription that then drives organ formation. But then we made synthetic polymers that are like, like uh, shrink wrap, but they're 3D foams. And we put the cells in them. And we actually moved to adult bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells. And you can artificially induce mesenchymal condensation, and you can get tooth, you know, m mineralization in vivo. Um, so we are looking at at, at organ f formation. I, I think we are, you know, we can't do everything. I think we we um, are going to go back in cancer because I've my work was all cancer as a disease of epithelial mesenchymal interactions, and I was just here for a grant where the hope is to take primary human tissues of normal and then different stages of cancer progression, have the stroma, have the epithelium in these chips begin to add back, you know, immune cells, stroma, normal tumor, and look at how they affect the developmental process. But uh, I think they would be useful for, if you could pose your question well, because you can control it, but we haven't done it yet. Okay. Well, let's thank you. Thank you.